Good evening. Good evening. I don't know if you can, there we go. This is sound like the uh, microphone was working with us here enthusiasm. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, I'm going to ask you to start time for tonight. For those of you who are new, anybody who's not been here before? <laughs> so good evening is just a, a thing we do every week. It usually takes me three times to give the enthusiasm, but here I'll catch it on now. Just in time for us to end the lecture too, and have to start over. Sure. But we do have two more programs after tonight, so um, please come to those. Eric will introduce Eric. Will you talk about next week? Or? Oh, no. Okay. We have Judy and Judy, um, Judy Hinsign and Judy Hendrickson, who are always bring a good, a good crowd when they're going to be talking about some really cool stuff. So um, thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's a really lovely evening. so. Um, if you're coming inside instead of enjoying the beautiful weather outside. Uh, well, I'm very incredibly grateful to have this partnership with the Great Stone to buy that society. I think we, we make a great team. And uh, yes, and you all are the best booster club we have. So thank you again for this coming. As mentioned before, we can't keep on bringing this series to you every year without your support and your attendance um, to these programs that we offer. So again, thank you. For those of you who are new, the bathrooms, if you take men's a left, a left, and a left, you'll be at the men's room, and women's a left, a left, and a right, you'll be at the women's room. Um, these programs are live streamed, so if you want to go back and see 40 or just say something tonight that you just can't remember, you can always go back online and watch it again. Get <coughs> or if you can't make the next two programs, you can go online and watch those live or Afterwards, and if you didn't make it to our first five programs, those are also online um, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube uh, channel, and on our website. So, there's <coughs> different places where you can access them and watch them. And then finally, out of respect for our speakers tonight, if you ask that everybody silence their cell phones right now, and then to keep us on track, I'm going to pass the baton on to the great seven by the point of Erica Keller here to introduce. <coughs>
somewhere. Okay? I'm going to talk about a Bridgeport guy. I'm going to first tell you that as a sixth grader, I remember this young guy who took the bus from Raven, from Raven to Blaine, and he was dating a girl off the street from me. His name was Bill Mazeroski. He, uh, he was a shy guy, but he, and that was Mark Watts, who used to be our basketball coach, his sister. So Master Rossi, I got to know him then. And then when my dad came to the game in Fort Steel, I got to carry his gym back to his car and park. So maybe you're lucky to you know, get an autograph. So I want to show you something for a second. This is Master Rossi's glove in high school. Now, I'm going to bring my glove three times larger than this. Look how small it is. I mean, no wonder he's the best second baseman ever because he was so good at filming. But also, this is a bat. Now, today, the kids use a living bat. Take this piece of timber, you, you got somebody's attention. Let me tell you, no wonder he ball so good. But he was also a great basketball player in Ohio State. He didn't play football, he wasn't allowed. And my first topic was about Phil Negro, graduated in 1957. His sophomore year, after he won the Little Big Mountain Nazi Ball, he was undefeated. So Perkins Field had to play a team called Warren Consolidated up there in Tilton, Mass by Mass pitched the work to start it. Bill pitched for Bridgeport Bulldogs. Mass beat him one nothing. Here's Mass coming to home plate after he hit the home run on Bill Negro to win the playoffs, to win the section. They went to state the morning to start it. Mass pitched in the morning, beat Toledo. Pitched in the afternoon, which you can't do today. And he lost to Cincinnati. So, my experience started out at a young age. Phil, his dad, Phil Sr., worked in the blind line with my dad. And we knew each other, and he played basketball and football. He worked real hard to be a major league baseball player. I mean, seven years in the minors. He played, he played for Blaine and Barton. Coal mining league. And it's on a Sunday afternoon, I can't think of the scout name from Land Braves, said, We want to sign you up. So he went to the parents' house. <laughs> of course, this is the way Phil said. They talked to the parents. And they said, $500. And the Schneeper said, We don't have money like that in our house. Well, we're paying you. <laughs> And on, he be able to become one of the best baseball players, outstanding knuckleball pitcher. And, you know, through this course, I saw his 200 win. I saw his 300 win. 200 win was up in Pittsburgh, so it was local. His 300 win, I'll share with you. I went twice to New York, Detroit, Cleveland. The last game of the year, Toronto. Uh, I took my dad. My mom passed away at a young age. So my dad enjoyed sports as well as I did. So we went to New York. And Mr. Steinberg came up to me. Where does Mr. and Mrs. Big Grove's closest airport? That's a high county airport. Well, it looks like he's going to win this game. I'm going to fly him up so that he can see it and have a party afterwards. I said, well, they don't fly. Well, that's all right. I'll make sure they get here. Well, anyway, Don Madley, great first baseman, made an error. Phil lost the game. After the game, the guy says, Phil's not going to be with you. We got a limousine for you. So I thought it'd be a limousine for me and my dad. No, a limousine for my dad and one for me. We went to a private party, George Steinbrenner. And that's the way George Steinbrenner was. He did a lot of good things, Phil said, and a couple of times he visited hospitals. So, but uh, one character, Billy Martin, you heard of Billy Martin, the manager. So Billy took a liking to 
to the Valley guys. And uh, so he fills up in Toronto the night before we had dinner. And that's ironic. Joe got traded to the Yankees. Joe, Joe and Phil Bills are going to see. So the dinner before was those ball players eat the same place the other ball players. Remember Al Oliver? He played for Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, so he got traded to uh, Toronto. And he walked up to the table and said, Phil, since we made playoffs, I'm the only one swinging the pitch, but that knuckle ball's too hard to hit. Louis Sarger said, like, hit a butterfly. You can't hit that knuckle ball. He said, I'm not going to mess up my timing. He said, well, I'm not doing the right ball tomorrow. And Joe says, how much how many drinks he had? I said, you know, that's all he does is throw the right ball. It's fastball at 60 miles an hour. So he enters a game, doing nothing but crazy sliders, slow ball, bloopers, not to the last batter. And I said, I gave you at least maybe to tell the detail. Then he struck out a corner for a brave guy, Jeff, Jeff Burrow. So, anyway, he put me at the same hotel. I said, Phil, I can't pay the bill. And he said, I'm a scout for the Yankees. He said, don't worry, soccer is up there. I said, oh, I don't want to get in trouble. He said, don't worry. So anyway, after the game, Billy Martin, <clears throat> who was a character, he says to me, where do you want? I said, Pittsburgh. No, you're not going to Pittsburgh. This guy's a Hall of Famer. 300 wins. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. My buddy's got a bar on 54th Street in New York. The only Yankee Clipper. I look outside, there's a plane with the Yankee logo on the tip of the plane. Next thing you know, I'm walking on the plane. I said, Dad, don't talk to anybody in first class. It's going to be Sunday. And everybody asked, what are we doing here? <laughs> so we sat in the back and we go to, to this, got a cab, went to the bar. Joe, Phil went back to the to see your dad in the hospital. But those are the experiences I had uh, that year he got fired. No, he got fired five times. So him and George Shirley got married one time because they were going to separate a lot. So anyway, <clears throat> I, I went to spring ball the following spring for a couple of years. And guess who's there? Bill and Mark. So I go, I say, Bill, we had a I'm sorry, you got fired. Oh, don't worry about it. George will be calling me. He'll be bitter. It's a manager. He's my hero. He said he won't see July. He won't see the All Star. Guess what? Yo, you didn't see the All Star game. He got fired, though he got placed back down there. So, Joe and Joe and Phil really enjoyed playing ball with the same team with the Yankees. They did that in 1974 with the Atlanta Braves. Let's see here, Joe. Great athlete, great guy. I played baseball with him in high school. He went to West Surrey State College. Our great coach, George Cavalli. I don't know if people know George Cavalli. He was a bus driver, uh, superintendent here in Blair for years. Coach Cavalli, I played second base. My book was this thick to know what to do if somebody's on second base, third base, one out, second, two outs. I mean, he was outstanding. So we really had a foundation there. And Joe went to West Surrey State College, and they won the 1964 NAIA World Series. And also Joe played, played college basketball at West Surrey. He got drafted by the Chicago Cubs as a second baseman because he was a good hitter and also as a pitcher. He spent many years with Houston, he was a 20-game winner in 1979, so was Phil. So I went to the Super Bowl and walked, walking down the street. And uh, like anything else in New Orleans, you get to know everybody that afternoon. And this guy was with us and seemed to know football a good bit. So I'm down the street running Joe, and Joe said, who is he? I said, oh, no, what's your name, Tommy? Oh, Tommy Kramer quarterback for the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> Joe says, boy, what, how smart are you? I said, I don't know. It, it seemed to know football pretty good, you know. So we went to this bar. And I remember it well, because Joe and I used to tease each other. 
and I used to sell suits out of the trunk of my car, and I sold Joe a couple of suits. I said, Joe, I never got paid for you know the suits I gave you. Oh, Nancy sent you a check. I said, don't give me that. Sent me the check. So the bartender, and in the bar was Philadelphia Phillies. If you pay attention to baseball, they won the World Series that year. They had Boone as a catcher, and Mike Smith that played for high university with the third baseman, and, and maybe Pete Rose, I forget. But anyway, and uh, Joe was bragging to me. He said, how much do you think I'm making this year? I said, well, you're the second in Cy Young Award, and you tied your brother. Both won 20 games. I said, you had a great year. I said, oh, 100,000? Nah, 200? 400? I said, that's great. I said, bartender, get everybody their drinks. So he gets a small, thank God it was a small bar. And it, it, it was like a hundred and some dollars. I said, I'm not paying Joe. And he says, uh, he says, you, you open your big mouth, Gordy, you're paying. I said, I'm not paying. You owe me money. I'm not paying. You want to be the big shot, you know, play the role and everything else. So anyway, they're a sports announcer. I can't think of his name. And uh Back in 1970, they've been good to the community. We had to, Steph and I worked on the golf tournament for 20 some years. Phil was there for 20 some years. Only missed once. Joe came up once to replacing. So we were, we was always blessed. I mean, we had money for a library in Bridgeport, and we had uh, I, the other good athlete I want to touch on, John Howitzen. And I got pictures. 
Jerry Lewis is part of I want to come up here later and look at some pictures. But anyway, Cleveland Browns wanted to have a They had an old pro wide receiver named Gary Collins. I knew John well. He gave my sister a little bit of a new one on that one. Football wasn't a sport. He didn't like it dirty. And uh, I thought he could get there. <laughs> Besides verbal, physical, uniform eyes. I remember we had a class reunion. George Kavoy was the speaker. And John and Beth, his wife, were there. They weren't known to be there at all. And George stood up and said, John, you know me. Coach, it's been 25 years. I knew I should have slid. <laughs> we was in a tournament out in Zanesville, Philo. And John was on third base, and he didn't slide in the home. Being 6'5", the throw was high, and the catcher couldn't get him. But he stood up. And the catcher had the opportunity while he was standing. And well, John didn't want to get dirty. So when they honored John out the high state, Jim Trussell wanted to know why John didn't play football, Cleveland Browns. He said, put it this way. I made, we had three scrimmages. I made the top. I got to see Jimmy Brown take the ball from the 20 yard line down to the eight yard line. Now it's tight formation. So now I've got to block this path. Remember a guy named Big Daddy Dixon? Yeah. Pittsburgh Silver, Baltimore, Colts. Yeah. So I named Big Daddy. Well, Big Daddy put John's column in the ground and put him in the ground. John said, I go to home. My ear looks where my nose is, and my face has to where my ear And I straightened my helmet, and I said to myself, I'm playing basketball. <laughs> and it was fussy because, as you can see, with all the great ball players, Bill Russell, I went to John Seven, I went to John's game with Bossy. I mean, there's Bill Russell. Best basketball player I've ever seen, John Hamilton. Read all that. All of my famous ball players, John Hamilton. Oh, a super guy, a super person. Okay. Bobby Douglas. Bobby and Joe Negro played on the Little League team in Little League. They did real good. Bobby was good. Great act. And last time we played St. Clairville, little Bobby scored a touchdown 75 yards on a punt, another one 60 some yards. He was quick, he was fast, good baseball player, outstanding wrestler, and a great person. George Cavalli was the father of Bobby. Again, I'll mention Sports Illustrated. They had Bobby wrestling out there in the cave background. Talks about Bobby being raised by his grandparents. His great grandfather that lived in Africa. On the tribes in Africa, wrestling is a big sport. You know, internationally, wrestling is more of a bigger sport than basketball and baseball is internationally. Even Havlicek said at a banquet, he said, here we are, Joe and Bill and myself, all in Lansing, Bobby down in Blaine, Ohio. And when I travel abroad, people ask me about wrestling. I told them, Bobby, you know Bobby Douglas. He's the best freestyle wrestler in the world. How did he get there? When the wrestlers made call. Again, Coach Kavali, he went from Bridgeport to Russell, he took all these athletes with him. Plus, um, and if you win the Division II today, which was NAIA classification, you get to go to the national tournament. So Bobby runs the local the, uh, Division II NAIA. Now he gets to wrestle Division I. I got to meet the guy, Mickey Martin, from Oklahoma. Two time national champion. The coach said, Got a kid from West Virginia, conference off two top. I said, 
white kid. Okay. He said, I wasn't talking. But man, he beat me two up in the first period. He said, man, he can tie his shoe standing up. His arm is so long. He said, he got my inside ankle up on my back. And praise, praise the Lord, get, get me out of this situation. And he beats Bobby six to four. And Bobby had a good match with him. He went over to his coach and said, he better recruit him. Bobby got a full scholarship across the back. He went on to Oklahoma. But he didn't finish there. He was the first black guy to wrestle for the United States Olympics, 1964, Tokyo. 1968, Mexico City. He wasn't allowed to be in the same dorm with the other one wrestling. He got food poisoning. He lost the match. He got blinded. The saying some facts happen. He's been the more Olympics than any out of the athletes. As a coach, an athlete, and an assistant. In 92, I got to go to Barcelona. He was the head coach. A guy named John DuPont. DuPont Chemicals. Maybe you saw the movie. Pumps. Pumps track. Anyway, about John DuPont. He wasn't successful in the business, but he showed his mom that he could trust him. So Bobby had a team in Philadelphia. And he called me and he says, Gordy, I don't think they want me as coach. I said, why? He said, I'm at the new And he says, you've been nothing but rude to me. What shall I do? I said, get your stuff, go in the, the library and meet with him. Excuse yourself, thanks for the hospitality, and just leave. He said, I said, either think about it and pray about it, because I don't want you to lose the opportunity to hit good. He said, I did. I ran through the house. I said, where? What is man here? I said, it's, he lives downtown Philly. He said, yeah, he got like 10 acres, you know. So anyway, DuPont wanted to control the wrestlers, even in practice. So anyway, I'll finish the story, but so we go to Barcelona and we win it all with the Russians competing. And we're at this the restaurant drinking the wine with the host. The DuPont says to everybody, this wine's no good, I'll bring my own wine. Had a chartered plane in a case of wine over his wine. Just to insult the people. So you know, we get a bad reputation with people like that. To finish the story, Mark and Dave Schutz won the gold medal in the LA in 84, which I was there too. And Mark hung around there and worked out with DuPont. DuPont, I don't know if he was gay or not, it was questionable, but he approached him and he ended up killing him. The police came to his house. He had a World War II tank in his garage, so he got in a tank. They tried to arrest him. Many hours later, he was arrested. He's in a mental hospital, but he passed away. I'm just telling you the story. So Bobby went through that, you know, just wasn't fair in a way. You like this story. He had a hand weaving college at the time. And I helped him out. He says, you got a suit on the bar, pair of shoes? I said, yeah, it's what do you need? He said, don't worry, I'll be gone for a day. I'll be back. So I went in. He was in Arizona State in 1988. He won the national championship with his team. So Gene Smith, the AD for High State, was the AD. So Bobby come back. Bobby's not good on finance. Most coaches, if there's finances, they're not going to get unless they make a big time. So anyway, Bobby said, do I get anything for winning the national championship? No. And Gene said, I'm the only black guy here who makes money. So Bobby says, you know what? I was state once. He said he didn't pay 55000 he didn't pay me 90 So he went and flew to Iowa for an interview. Came back, there was a newspaper down on my desk. Douglas, uh, Gable? Yeah, Dan Gable. Dan Gable. 
I was, this is home base, you know, coach at Iowa in the Big Ten Conference, one of all these years. They will be aware of Douglas is your, in your backyard, meaning he's one of the coach at Iowa State, and he's we're probably still in the class now. So anyway, he said, you don't seem too happy. Well, I mean, no offense, but if I had a farm and I had a bunch of good kids wrestling, he gave them my front porch talking, you're on the back porch talking, and I'm talking to my kids. I mean, they would be no offense. He said, You know what, Corey? I'm the best freestyle wrestler. Once they meet my dog, my, my wife Jackie, and get to know us, you'll see how good we are to the kids. Well, guess what? Sanderson, kid was a wrestler. So was the street brother. Congratulations, you're not big 
little things like that touch me. Yeah. If, can you tell us when did these all, all these folks graduate from? Okay, Kirk was like in order. Bill Beaver, 1957. His neighbor, John Halpern, 1958. 1961 was Bobby Douglas, 1962, Joe Nico. Oh, oh, oh. Bill Jonka, linebacker, number 58. Never lost a Big Ten game for High State. Captain the senior in 1957, national champion. Never lost a Big Ten. That's when they, you know, there was no freshman. The sophomore, junior, senior. Bill Jonko played no linebacker for the Minnesota Vikings. Didn't play for the Atlanta Braves. Atlanta Falcons, excuse me. When he was in, after his career, he was a long-time hit scout. A long time hit scout for the Arizona Cardinals. Bill Jocko, one tough football player. We're not to tell you, my buddy Joe got in some trouble. And uh, Joe, uh, he's not too smart. But anyway, he's on a picture now. And the number ball, to make sure you get a good grip on it, you wouldn't hurt your body. So anyway, he had it in the back pocket. As you see in his baseball card, he acts like I did nothing wrong. His hands up like the FBI just got his hands on. And the middle foul falls out the back pocket. Well, the second baseman umpire saw him. So he comes out and says, hey, technically you can go to the dugout. You can foul all you want. But when we get the picture now, you're not allowed to have any options like that. Some guys would have jello or anything that makes you fall loose. You can't have any. So Joe ends up on David Letterman. And he went to the carpenter belt. He got a hammer and a sander and everything. What do you think? So I made up these memory boards. <laughs> Say it ain't so, Joe. The Negro guy. I'm passing out to everybody. So I've got a lot of years now. Try to tell you some more good stories. Billy Martin was an alcoholic, I have to say. Billy Martin was probably, Bill Negro and Joe told me, probably one of the best managers. He knew the game. He would have Bill hit balls at Fenway Park. Against the wall, so the outfielder was great to could play it off the wall and see how the ball's going to bounce. I mean, that's going into details. But uh, he made sure the guys had suits and tie on when they were on the bus travel. A couple of times up in Cleveland, signed them to be here and continued to get on the bus. and said, I'm not going to hear a book with you. So I went to him, I like the bus. I want to buy the bus. Okay, whatever you know. One time I was in Detroit and uh, we're wrapping up the road. Luke and Ellie came up and said, Hey, I'm not keeping it down. So it was like 2 30. He said, uh, Bar Bar's Club. Billy said, What do you mean, Bar's Club? I'm ready to drink. I'm really good at the game. I'm up late. Okay. I said, Go get your car. I said, Where are we going to get a drink? 2 33 o'clock in the morning. A friend of mine's got a bar downtown. Let's go. I get in the car. One of those old bars that was holding the window a little bit. Mom, tell me where. Oh, hey, it's Billy. Oh, open up. We go in there. I mean, he's just a character. But as a baseball manager, he would, I'm saying, Questions. <laughs> and you always ask some good questions. This is her second time. They're so lovely. <laughs> How much time are you up here, Jeff? How much time is it? Oh, yeah, this is the one, right? Okay, this is the 
with some magic jacket for the Hall of Fame. He gave it to me. Yeah. 2001. This is a jersey signed. This is still Negro's jersey. Pennant. Matt Ross is probably one of the most humble guys. He doesn't want to talk about the 1960s. Getting a home run. But I told him it wasn't for Hal Smith, the catcher, who made a three run home run a few minutes before he wouldn't be on stage. I said, You hit a double play in the sixth six inning. That has to be a guy on second. He didn't help the team at all. He was easy to tease. Let's see. This uh, Legion team, Joey Maroon, there's four guys that got drafted by a different baseball team. My brother on Kelly Conway, the catcher of the Pirates. Let's see. Just a lesson. I mean, you get so close to these guys, you get to know them. Like Steph and I, the Negro family. Phil was a comedian, and he was doing stunts and laughing and jokes and magic. And, and we go to family reunions and every 4th of July down in Atlanta, dust down the arena. And Phil would entertain him at least in that period. You say to yourself, hey, he's a Hall of Famer. You know, I mean, people come up to him and say, kind of hard around, no problem. Sometimes you do stunts like better hope about him. So he, he had a plastic ass. He had a little back. Somebody comments, can I draw that good? Kiss my body. No. I didn't show that. <laughs> Joking around, you know. My dad looked like Yoda the Bear. So we're at Cleveland having breakfast. <laughs> and people say, why did that make sign? How about you, Yogi? <laughs> I'm not Yoda the Bear. <laughs> yes. He'll say, give it up, Yogi. Come on, you gotta sign it. Next thing you know, my dad signed Yogi. What are you doing? He made me. I'm like, okay, he made me. It's, that's, they were fun to be with. You know, Bobby Douglas is hot in downtown Pittsburgh. And he's raising money for the Olympics. And George Steinberg was there. I said, tell George, you know Joe, Joe grew up. I said, Bobby, you ate some weight, you look chubby. Well, he had his long johns on, and he's wearing tops. They've got the white socks. I was like, what the heck are you doing? I said, it's a divorce. Thank you. And I just flew into my life. I said, take that off. Well, Bobby always wore a, 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 a pouch. Like when he traveled, he wrote something. He had to have a passport, so it's easy. He got the pouch on. I said, you're just a bump, coal mine forth, and play a high. You're an insult. And you see, you know, we're grabbing each other, they take Paul and us, and that just, we're wrestling. He's mad at me, I'm mad at him. <laughs> just little things like that. Is, you look back and say, look great guys, and no matter how high up they got, the more humble they got. How would you got the end of National Basketball Association maybe 10 years ago. So he invited me to Kansas. And uh, I said, John, I'm upset they went to the song. But you know, he said, how have they been busy? You know, all that. He said, with me, bro. I said, it takes five times for you to get in the Hall of Fame. He said, you were worried about it than me. You know, it's okay. They know me. Let's see that. Yes. Going down the school, we got the years to the combination. Yes, 539 wins. Yes, nobody's going to break that. You know why? Pitchers don't know by anybody. They don't know five. They know three, maybe two. You know, that's a record of the great brother, the brothers. They break the courage on the record. And uh, the whole thing, Monk Bill, was just always came and he was just honored. I was there one year. Pete Rose, George Foster, they're like a five and nine school. Like the old Murphy we had in there. So anyway, it's $25 for an order. So I'm over here and they're signing. 
he says to me, who are you here for? I said, uh, Phil Negro. I got 1,712 hits off of Phil Negro and 1,210 hits off of Joe Negro. I wish Mrs. Negro had another son. He said, what? I said, you know what? You can't walk out the Hall of Fame. Let her own get in the Hall of Fame. But he's going to be in the Hall of Fame today. George Foster said, boy, you, you told him. He changes holding the man, the man, the man, the man. changes all the man. See, he turned around and said, you know what? I have 24 ball players on the team. Joe Negro, five times gold above. He gave my team to this year. I mean, he, whether he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame, Bill was on the committee. He said, the only thing that got beat away, he lied to the commission. If he told the truth, they were justified. But because he lied, but then Pubhouse has that saying there, you can't gamble, and it's, it's going to hop. Maybe later on. Does it deserve it? I think so. Sure. There's still some guys in the Hall of Fame. I question them. Yeah. Anyway. But Tom is a gentleman. I want to call you some time. He's going to tell you about the All American Town. Tom is a town. Go ahead. I called him about a month ago, and I, I, I figured he might not talk about Blair athletes, and I, I just had to talk about him, you know, because it's just because of the rich history. Uh, Blair was given, there's a lot of misconception on this, Blair was given the name, the All-American Town, because of three exceptional athletes, and this by Francis Wallace, he was a writer, sports writer. Uh, these guys played back in the third. John, Jack Scanlon, Miller Rogers, and Mike Badger. Mike Badger was an All-American, uh, Olympic gold medalist, and he was also the second team, and in fact, the second team, second and third team. 1929, Miller Munges, 1930, and Bazrak, 31. I'll, I'm going to read a little bit about it. I'm going to cut this short. I'm going to do a short version. Katz Cadillac, he was a two-year letterman from Bel Air, 1927-1928. Okay, he was captain of the football team, four years on football team, three years on basketball. Okay, he was the Princeton quarterback. He was a three-year starter, third-team All-American, 1934. John Cass Cadillac, a name etched in Princeton football history, was a brilliant quarterback and a key player for the national championship in 1933. Cadillac was known as one of the finest passers ever seen in Palmer Stadium. His precision and tactical genius made him a field general of the highest caliber. His tackles were merciful, resonating throughout the stadium. The rasping impact of his hits left an indelible mark on every nook and cranny of the field. Cadillac's exceptional performance earned him the Poe Cup, the highest honor for Princeton football player in 1934. National Championship. In 1933, Cadillac played a pivotal role as the quarterback for the Princeton team that clinched the national championship. His brilliance extended beyond offense. He was also a brilliant defensive player. Cadillac's legacy lives on as a ball player and ball player, revered by fans and fellow athletes. His contribution to Princeton football remained legendary, and his name is forever associated on the gridiron. Miller Munges, three-year letterman of Blair, 1927, 28, 29. Miller Munges was a 1930 graduate of Blair High School. Four years football, four years basketball, three years track. 
Miller Munches, University of Pittsburgh quarterback, three-year starter, All-American second, third team. Miller was one of the best field generals in the East and particularly noted for his coolness under pressure. Mike Bazrak. I'm sure everybody heard of Mike Bazrak. He was a three-year letterman of Blair, 1928, 29, 30. He was a 31 graduate of Blair. Three years football, three years basketball, two track. Mike Bazrak was Duquesne University All-American in 1937. Bazrak was Duquesne University's first All-American selection and the most valuable player of the 1937 Orange Bowl game in Miami in which Duquesne defeated Mississippi State University 13 to 12. Later in 1937 was the first round draft pick, number five pick overall of the National Football League Pittsburgh Pirates, later called Pittsburgh Steelers. Bazrak only played two seasons in the NFL, retiring after the 38th season. Okay, I don't know. I don't know, I mean, you also heard of George Gipp, the play for Notre Dame. Well, he he died, and on his deathbed, he told Newt Rockney, he says, uh, remember me, win one for the Gipper. Well, our own Bel Air, John Nemec, was the one that threw the pass that uh, won the game against Army. Uh, Nemec is the most versatile back on the squad, a long distance punter, an accurate forward passer, and with great speed and elusiveness, he could always be relied upon to make the necessary gains against all sorts of opposition. Okay, John Nemec, he, not, I got to give you this detail. Okay, he led Notre Dame in passing 1927-28. He threw the pass to beat Army on November 10, 1928, in the game, in which Notre Dame was down 6 0. And Newt Rockney gave his famous win one for the Gipper speech at halftime to inspire his team. Here's a description of that game. The 1928 season was not classic Notre Dame, as they went into their game against Army with a record of 4 2. Meanwhile, the cadets, coached by Biff Jones, were the best team in the nation at 6 0. The words seemed to fall flat at the start of the third quarter, set up by a long kickoff return by Red Cagle. The Irish answered as the score remained deadlocked 6 6 in the fourth quarter. With dust settling over the stadium in the Bronx, Newt Rockney called upon Johnny O'Brien to enter the game for the first time. O'Brien reeled in a 32 yard pass from Johnny Nemec to give the Irish a 12 6 lead. Army would not go down without a fight, as the Irish had to make one big stop at the goal line. Preserve the win. The Irish would finish the season with a record of five and four while Army ended the season eight and two. Nemec uh, came to Blair. He, he coached from 1938 to 1943. And uh, his record was 36 and 18. And his, his assistant coach was Mike Bazrak, 1941-42. Here's a particular game that it, it kind of blows me away. I got this from a 75-year-old, 40 years with the Big Reds. I don't know where I got it, but in 1928, Blair was 9-1. Well, you never dreamed who beat him, and it wasn't the last game either. Martin's Ferry, 12 nothing. And I'm thinking to myself, how can this be? Because there was... Three All Americans and two pro, three pro players went to pro on this same team on Blair. And here comes Fair. And Blair had a defense, 30 points was scored on him. And they, that was their only blemish, was 12 nothing. And then I looked up Martin's Ferry. I said, What happened here? Well, Ferry went, they had 27 points scored on them. And Cleveland East was their only loss. The last game, somehow they played 11 games, 14 to 12. They lost to Cleveland. So what kind of team did Martin's Ferry have? You know, if Blair had five, six pro players and all Americans on. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the professional athletes from Blair. Okay, uh, in the program last year, I got with the athletic director, Josh Koenig, and uh, 
said, I got, I got to get these guys in here because Bel Air has the most pro players of anyone in the Valley. We're in second with 11. Bel Air has 19 players that went to the pros and they have two that play a drafter, but did not play uh, Wayne Farmer and Mike Ingram. Mike Ingram got hurt. He played four years at Ohio State, but I don't know what happened with Wayne Farmer. But I'm going to name these pro players. Mike Bazrak, center, Pittsburgh Pirates. Raymond Boner, quarterback, also played for Notre Dame. Canadian Football League. John Buddenberg, he was in the 90s. He played 35 games for Canadian football. Don Cara, Washington Redskins. He was a guard in the Pittsburgh Pirates. Jose Davis, quarterback, Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Canada. Nate Davis, San Francisco 49ers, Seattle Seahawks, and Indianapolis Colts. Andy Doris, defensive end, St. Louis Cardinals, New Orleans Saints, Seattle Seahawks, and Houston Oilers. Joey Galloway played for six teams. I'm not going to name them all. Seattle Seahawks. And Charles Todd Goodwin, New York Giants, 1935. Ron Lee, running back. Speaking of Ron Lee, I got to watch him in high school. This guy was unbelievable. He was like 6'4", 220 pounds, and they could not bring this guy down. Blair that year went 9-0-1, uh, and, and they got beat by – or. Uh, they got beat by Marietta 12-0. Well, I don't even want to talk about that game because it was a disaster going down there with the home cooking and all that. And Blair got so many penalties, it was unbelievable. I remember they, got, they had a 45-yard penalty. And what happened was, uh, I guess there was a clipping call on Ostrander. And then my brother that played, he, he took a fit. 15 yards on you, and Jake come out on the field and started yelling. He said, 15 yards on you. He said, he marched off 45 yards. This is down Marietta. Okay. Okay, Lance Mel, New York Jets, everybody knows him. Stanley Olszanizak, I can't pronounce that. He played for Pittsburgh Pirates football. John Bull Polinski, Chicago Bears. Nick Scorridge. Played for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Philadelphia Eagles head coach, and Cleveland Browns head coach. Now we have Ben Taylor, Clyde Thomas. I had the privilege of seeing him play. He was British Columbia Lions, Canada, and Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, John Chalmers Shabbat was a tackle. Dayton Triangle, 1921. Charlie Turner, offensive lineman. He played for Canadian teams. And the Blair guys, Wayne Farmer, he was drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers on a 24th round, 283 overall, but I don't he, he didn't get to play. But Mike Ingram, the way they tell me, he got hurt. He was drafted by the Redskins and the Boston Patriots, 31st round, 246 overall. And a little bit about Mike Ingram. Uh I got to watch him play. He used to plow cheerleaders out. This guy was unbelievable. He was like uh, 5'11", 220 pounds. And he played at Ohio State. Uh, they, uh, they played running back for Blair, and they put him on the line at Ohio State. He played four years at Ohio State. Uh, uh, okay, Raymond Boner. Raymond Boner was a 1927 graduate of Blair High. The following caption was written in the Bell Juan to Bud more than anyone else. Does BHS owe a large part of her football fame? The boy with the educated toe has pulled many a game out of the fire for us. Bud combines ability as an athlete and a scholar. Something that is said is indeed rare. He has gone to Princeton now, which he went to Notre Dame. And we hope that he and Obi will overrun Harvard and Yale in the future as they have overrun Martin Ferry and Wheeling in the past. He was 1933 at Notre Dame. He was a quarterback and drop kick specialist. And the, he played in the Canadian Football League for one year. He was the Blair head football coach, 1949 to 58. My dad 
spoke so much of Raymond Bonner. I had to go down every day. I was six years old to watch Blair practice. He's down by the city dump where they practice at. And that's all he talked about. He, he also talked about John Pazzini, which is in on the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, he made a statement. He was built like a fire plug with the speed of a greyhound. He tripped over a blade of grass and a new tied a new Philly game 2020. That was their own blemish in 1950 with John Pazzini. Okay. Uh, okay. Boner was the foot, football team captain and quarterback. His team posted an undefeated record of 9-0-1 and was a champion of the High Valley Athletic. After graduation, he had enrolled at West Virginia, but later would transfer to Notre Dame. He became athletic director later. Okay. I'm trying to move pretty fast here. I already went over these. I had to add one guy. I have to change that program because I added Raymond Boner, and I found out a guy named Roger Mass that graduated in Blair in 1933. He played for the Wilmington Clippers, a professional American football team that played from 1937 to 1942 and returned for the 46-49 season. Okay, John Bull Polinski. He, he graduated in 1922. It says a Blair grad, but I, I looked in all the yearbooks back then. I didn't see him. And in one of these, he, he went to a prep school in Texas before going to Notre Dame, I guess. He was at Notre Dame 1925, 26, and 27. He went to Chicago Bears Pro. Uh, John Poliski, freshman coach. He was a freshman coach in 1928. If one went to visit the Notre Dame gym on a Sunday morning in late September of this year when the freshmen were reporting for equipment, the natural thing would do the utter a prayer for the soul of the unfortunate whose job it was to sort and coach them. For there were approximately 500 aspiring Stolterers, Millers, and Crosby. Those were three of the guys of the uh, the uh, four horsemen lined up in a gym, each one most confident that he was destined to be a great Notre Dame player. In the center of the motley crew stood two men. One was Coach Rockney, the other John Poliski. John was one of Coach Rockney's tackles during the three seasons preceding this, and because of his ability and knowledge of the game, Rock considered Bull an ideal man for such a Herculean job. I'm flying through this. Another great athlete that almost went to the pros was Bill Boner. I guess that was Bud Boner's nephew. I got to see when he coached Marietta, I got to see a game when, you know, they Bud Boner coached against, you know, and Bill Boner coached at the same time. Bill graduated from Belair High School where he was an outstanding high school athlete. He competed in football, basketball, track, Earned all Eastern Ohio, all Ohio Valley, and honorable mention. All, all Ohio in three sports. After high school, Bill attended Tulane University. He was a three year letter winner in football and baseball. A college highlight for Bill was completing a 76 yard touchdown pass versus Notre Dame that stood as a Tulane record for more than 25 years. Upon graduation, he signed with the Pittsburgh Pirates for their minor league team in Salisbury, North Carolina. A year later, he entered the Navy and was named Athlete of the Year at Bainbridge Naval Base in Maryland, where he played football and baseball. Before leaving the Navy, he signed with the Baltimore Colts, but a knee injury prompted him to turn from coaching. After three years of teaching and coaching at his alma mater in Blair, he accepted a teaching assistant coaching job in Marietta. Okay, now... I have the number of Ohio Valley athletes from each school in the NFL draft from 36 to 2012. Blair had 12. Of course, that was just the draft. That's not all the guys that played. And Weirton was second with 11. Ferry, six. 
St. Clairsville, six, Steubenville, six, Lindsley, four, Toronto, four, three for, from Moundsville, Shadyside, Steubenville, Central, Bridgeport, had two, Fallensby, two, Wellsburg, two, and Wintersville, two. And, well, Union Local just had one, uh, McKivitz. It's, well, he was dead. Okay. I'm trying to move as fast as I can. If, is, is there any time left? I mean, I can end just now. Huh? Okay. Any questions? I've got a question. Bud Boner, I was always told by my father that Bud Boner kicked the field goal for Notre Dame and won the game. Do you know about that? Who about that? Wait a minute. Uh, I had the recap of the game here. Okay, as the quarterback for Notre Dame, under head coach Hunk Anderson, his career highlight occurred when his drop kick extra point enabled Notre Dame to defeat 9-0 Army by the score of 13-12 on December 2nd, 1933 in Yankee Stadium. I mean, I used to drop kick, you know, up the airport. I could do it pretty good, you know. If anybody, if any of you don't know what a drop kick is, you let the ball hit the ground first, and you got to time it perfectly, you know, to kick it. That's how they kick field goals back then. Is Greg Boner related to some of those Boner players? He's a cousin. I talked to Greg, yeah, and uh, yeah. You mean you mean you mean Mark Boner? Mark, yeah. Mark, Mark Mark's the way, cousin of yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but he he wrote all kind of articles. Well, there's a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy because he had. Blair was named the All-American Town because of Bud Boner, uh, uh, Cax Cadillac, and Munges. But Bud Boner was never an All-American. He probably wasn't as good as his, you know, Bill Boner. I mean, Bill Boner had a lot. Yeah, so I looked at another research, and, you know, like Bazrak, Bazrak was – Straight up All American. The other guys was second and third team All American. But then there's a controversy like the the movie Unstoppable. It's in a book. Uh, Blair's named the All American Town because of the movie Unstoppable and Silence of the Lamb. That's not true. Because this was way, way before that they named the All American Town. Any more questions? Did, to answer that question, if you don't mind, I'll listen to that question. Francis Wallace was an American sports writer from Bel Air, Ohio. Yes. He carried up on the hill. He used the name, the All-American Town, in a news article that he had written about those quarterbacks in major college football. And that's where it came from. Francis yeah. Wallace. The Francis Wallace apartments are named after Francis Wallace. Francis Wallace. Did you work for the newspaper? He wrote for uh, a sports, uh, I don't know what the name of it is, but it was a sports journal that had, you know, like weekly, like Sports Illustrated. If you go on Wikipedia, I was going to print it out. There's about a four-page thing about it. I knew the guy. I met him. He lived in North Belair. So... I didn't. I didn't even get into the baseball. Blair had four baseball players. They had a uh, baseball player. It was he's in Cooperstown. King Solomon White. And I didn't get to talk. I, I can I can I read one thing? Let me re, let me read one thing. If I can find, if I can find it.
Lee Patron. He was an outstanding basketball player in 1955, went to played with Jerry West in 1960-61. He's also known, I got to read this story because he's my hero. Carnegie Hero Fund Commission. Philip Lee Patron saved a woman from drowning, Blair, Ohio, March 9, 1961, from a bridge across the river. A 40-year-old woman dropped 90 feet into water, 16 feet deep, and then was carried rapidly downstream by the strong current. Patron, 23 student, was among a crowd attracted to the riverbank. Following the woman downstream, Patron ran 600 feet and then descended the steep bank, twisting his ankle. He removed his outer tire, stepped in the wall, cold water, and made a shallow dive to avoid scattered rocks near the bank. He then swam to the woman who was 90 feet from the bank and took hold of her by the waist. Already very tired, Patron was difficultly towed her 120 feet diagonally across the current to within 10 feet of the bank. A man then waded to them and aided the woman. Patron, for the woman was hospitalized for two weeks. Patron was nearly exhausted, but it's recovered. I thought, I thought that was great. Yeah. yeah. I recall that. Plus, he was a fantastic basketball player. Yeah. Yeah, he played with Jerry West, you know, WVU. He was unbelievable. I got stats in here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Gordy. Um, I think many of us probably remember a lot of those names and know a lot of people connected to a lot of those names. And um, just to show that there's a whole lot of history in the whole area. Oh, no, we're in this whole That's awesome. Yeah. We're going to do our drawings. So if you guys have your white tickets and your blue tickets, I think we're going to draw the. We'll do the dwarf prize white one first. You guys grab your, grab your white tickets. We're just going to reach in, shake around. It's going to be a big one. All right. All right. Ticket 6610424. 661424. Oh, I don't have a winner. Go on over to the table. You can pick your door prize. And the next one is for our. Raffle this evening, our blue ticket. And our blue ticket is 